Welcome to the 17th season of Study with the Best, the magazine show that's all about CUNY. I'm Tina Beth Pina. On this month's episode, Justice and Freedom Through the CUNY Lens. From a persecuted scientist in the Soviet Union to studying transitional justice in Cambodia. We've got this and so much more. But first up, Kossel Path lived through the genocide orchestrated by the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia when he was a child. Now, as a professor right here at Brooklyn College, he takes students to Cambodia every year to research how survivors best find justice and heal. I was born just uh, six months before the Pol Pot regime uh, took power in Cambodia. And at times, uh, my parents, uh, like other ordinary people, cheered because uh, they hoped to have a new egalitarian regime, that everybody will be better off, right? But that promise turned out to be uh, very different. Between 1975 and 1979, the Khmer Rouge regime, led by Pol Pot, orchestrated a genocide. Mass killing, torture, forced labor, malnutrition, and diseases led to the death of 25% of the Cambodian population. My parents were sent off to work in different camps, labor camps, and they were not allowed to see me. My memory today is, uh, is about uh, the starvation. Nearly two million people were killed. Um, many of my family members were, became victims. Paul Pot and the Khmer Rouge regime were overthrown in 1979 after almost four years of genocide. My parents refused to tell me what happened at home. And I, several times, I kept uh, pressing them to talk about what happened. But they said, you know, they don't want to visit that chapter of the history. And because it was too painful, uh, too tough to tell, to, uh, they want me to move on and think about a brighter future. But I kept insisting on knowing what happened because it's uh, important to me. I want to know who I, who I am, how I got here, what my parents went through. In 1993, the United Nations Transitional Authority of Cambodia had its first democratic election. With newly released historical documents, undergraduate student Casal started to research the missing pieces of his past. And I asked my parents, look, now I'm, I know what happened, so now it's your it's time to tell me what happened. I'm mature enough to, to handle what happened. So then they began telling me about, you know, my aunt, she's beautiful, she's young, she was forced to marry a Khmeru uh, soldier, and she didn't love, she, never, she had never met. And then she uh, came um, uh, to see me for the last time, and she uh, held me in her arms before she left, and then she disappeared. Only days later, um, they found out, the villagers found out that she hanged herself to death as an act of refusal to marry someone he didn't love. In 1997, the Cambodian government and the UN established a hybrid court in order to prosecute the senior leaders of the Khmer Rouge regime. But more restorative justice was needed for Cambodian victims. The concept of transitional justice, it's often seen as a sort of Western conception of moving a uh, society from post-conflict era to a more democratic rule of law. And that's the concept that I find um, incomplete when it applies to Cambodia. Casal's search for his own history became his career. His research took him to the U.S. where he received his Ph.D. He now teaches human rights and transitional justice at Brooklyn College. Every year, he takes students to Cambodia to interview survivors and perpetrators of the genocide. You can teach students uh, through textbooks, through experts, but at the end of the day, it's about making connection. And this is why bringing students to Cambodia allow them to make personal connection with survivors, with participants um, in the genocide, and also see how they struggle to survive and also to, to move on with their life. Instead of just having the classroom lectures where you feel sort of disassociated to the information given to you, you're right there living those moments with the people who you're interviewing. I was kind of learning from these people in Cambodia what they experienced in order to understand what my parents experienced and to understand why they wouldn't want to share that kind of experience with the younger generation. We got to see the contrast between the actual legal justice taking place versus how the, the Cambodian people are recuperating and rehabilitating. Each family and each social status experience is something very different. Um, and the government and the UN basically agreed that in order to not bring the country into havoc, we're only going to judge the 
top two, five officials. And in that way, that kind of feels like a brush under the carpet for a lot of people. One lady told us, um, I have no idea why they're trying to prosecute uh, all those uh, ailing top leaders. What about this person right next to, to, to me here? Live a comfortable life, but 35 years ago, uh, seized uh, uh, a perpetrator. What we saw in Cambodia was that there were people who were implicated in the genocide, but at the same time, they themselves were victims through the psychological terrors, um, the the mass propaganda, the uh, you know the fear of not knowing whether you would be able to live the next day. When crimes like this happened, it will take many generations to heal. So we have to start from being by being realistic about about what happened and what it takes to get people to move on find their own way uh, through various forms, through culture, religion, mental health professional to help survivor cope with the trauma. Because at the end of the day, that's what matters to local people. What they want need to be taken into account and into uh, the formulation of transitional justice. One restorative project underway in Cambodia is the Slok Rith Institute. It will address the genocide in three ways. The schools of genocide and human rights to teach Cambodian uh, students about what happened in the country the research. And then the other component is genocide museum. Uh, after the Holocaust, we say never again. And then, of course, many other genocide can you do. It is happening today. It's happening today. From a scholarly perspective, an edu uh, educator perspective, raise awareness. And that's what I do. That's what I believe, uh, is to bring students to, to, to see, to make connection with real people so that they have lasting impact. Uh, so coming back, they become concerned citizen. Who knows one day they become policy maker um, on soon. I will continue to do that. If one out of the students uh, one day will make a difference, I'm happy with that. Queens is home to over 800 languages, some on the verge of extinction. But CUNY linguist Daniel Kaufman is helping to keep some of these languages from disappearing for good. <laughs> The Endangered Language Alliance is a non-profit organization based here in New York City and we work, we work primarily with immigrant uh, communities here who speak endangered languages. <laughs> There's many, many communities now, especially over the last 20, 30 years, who have come to New York uh, and have brought their own language that is being lost back home. We work with them to document those languages and to also promote those languages and to try and better understand how those languages are surviving and, and what their life, the life of those languages here in New York City. And we try and educate the public as well uh, about the value of linguistic diversity and what language endangerment is. In language, we navigate the possibilities we create with one another. And so if we respect the language we have, we respect the ancestral mediums and, and knowledge that come through us. In a way, this kind of uh, started from a, a, a class that I taught in CUNY nine years ago uh, where I would bring students from the graduate center around the city to work on fieldwork projects with endangered languages. When I saw that there was great interest on the part of the students and there was great interest, more importantly, on the part of the community and individuals, that was kind of what gave me the feeling that it could work, that these are groups that need to be brought together. You have community speaking endangered languages, you have linguists, you have other people who, are, who want to volunteer to helping promote and, and understand these languages. I was lucky that I, I actually went to CUNY. This is linguistically, culturally, ethnic-wise, uh, it's diverse and you can meet many people uh, there and then learn from them. If they want to work on a language, they have their resources inside. They have students from, from Croatia, there are students from um, India, there are students from all parts of the world. 
New York is really uniquely placed. We get immigration from all parts of the world almost equally, and there's very few cities in the world that can say that. So we have a very large and diverse African community, a very large and diverse um, Himalayan community, a Filipino community, um, a European communities. So in that sense, I, I feel that New York City is definitely the most linguistically and ethnically diverse city in the world. The Endangered Language Alliance uh, helped produce this language map of Queens, an anecdotal language map of Queens, for a book called Nonstop Metropolis by Rebecca Solnit and uh, Joshua Jelly Shapiro. It's filled with fascinating different uh, atlases, looking at all different aspects of the city. And Queens, because it's known for its linguistic diversity, the zip code around Jackson Heights is the most linguistically diverse zip code in all of the United States. And so this map focuses particularly on Queens and its languages. We plotted out the languages that were represented in the library system, so kind of the official national languages in one color. And within those communities, all of the unofficial languages, the regional languages, local languages that are in many cases not even recognized as, as official languages back home. And those are the languages that, that are endangered and that we're most interested in. So mother tongue lo mi em tawara mi lusting thing to click lo this lo language because lo here lo New York all got two lot people so we talk tawara mi na mama lo mi. By the end of the century, we'll lose somewhere between half to 90% of the world's languages. You can only imagine what else we'll lose with those languages, right? Not just the words and the grammatical systems, but also uh, everything that was transmitted in those languages. The songs, the histories, the proverbs, the knowledge about the environment, the, the knowledge about how peoples were historically related to each other. You can say that, okay, languages come and go, uh, it doesn't, like, it is not a big deal, but it's a big deal when it is dying and we are not doing anything about it. You know, when all you can speak is English or, or Spanish or Chinese, then that can be, in fact, a reminder that you've lost what's yours and something foreign has been forced upon you and you, you live that every day. When we think about the riches of our own language, whatever language that is, we should imagine that those riches are duplicated 6,000 times in every language, and to lose that is like losing a museum, as, as one famous linguist said. Recording language creates a permanent record of it, right? So now, especially in the, in the digital age, a recording is actually much, much uh, more valuable and easier to work with, I would say. The linguistic record optimally should be something that's multi-purpose. So it's good for linguists trying to study the language. It's also good for speakers trying to revive the language, perhaps. It's good for uh, trying to understand the, the, the oral literature, the stories, and other aspects that maybe we're not even thinking about uh, today, but that may be very valuable to look back on in, in 50 or 100 years. Act of archiving always has to take into account the different players, the different, and especially the community from which it comes from, not to kind of take it away from them and put it in some digital vault, but rather think of it as a way of facilitating um, the community's access to the language. If you are in a country that English is a dominant language, you need to learn it. But nobody will say that, okay, human being only can speak one language. They cannot handle two languages. Yes, they can. If you go to Europe or you can go to India, people speak three languages or four languages. It's just the perspective. You change the perspective and you can have a multilingual America and happier one. As a globe-trotting musician, Syrian-born clarinetist Keenan Asme values the freedom to travel. But this CUNY grad found himself locked out of the USA this past February.
I heard the news the same way everybody else did. And my show, I think, was, was February 1st or February 2nd in Beirut. I was playing Mozart clarinet concerto, but also playing uh, a suite for improvised an orchestra that I've composed. And, and that was in a time where I don't know, after the end of the concert, if I'll be able to fly back a few hours later back to, back to New York. I don't think I've ever played as free as that night. I felt incredibly powerful. I'm playing now and nobody can stop me from, from playing, and this sound will travel somewhere. So I was in, you know, in a, like an unknown situation for a few days. When I attempted to fly back, that was a day after uh, the judge in, uh, in Seattle, I think, blocked the executive order. So I was able to fly back. I mean, for me, it still continues to be, to be incredible that one signature can change the lives of so many people. You know, I managed to, to overcome that. But now I know that there are lots of people, you know, there are lots of lives that have been shattered by this. You know, this has been happening in my head for the last six years since the, uh, you know, the Syrian uprising began. Yeah, I mean, you have a bigger perspective about what is, what does it mean to be in a bad situation, you know? I mean, and that was not a bad situation. I was already in a hotel room in Beirut. I had a roof over my head. I had food and I had money to, to buy food, you know, all of this. And you cannot, be, it cannot become the biggest thing in the world, it's not. Life is much larger than what you are. In a situation like this, this is when I, when I realize how lucky I am to have, to be a musician actually, to have a, a channel through which I can express my, not only my anger, my frustration, but also my hopes and, you know, to express yourself. It's quite a luxury to have. I'm a graduate of CUNY, did my uh, doctorate of musical arts. So I have a degree from, uh, I got my master's and graduated from, from Juilliard. And I did my bachelor also in music at the Higher Institute of Music in Damascus. My band is a New York based group. It's called the Kenan Azmi City Band. I started the band in 2006. And it, it took me a while to actually to start my own band here because I had my own band back in, back in Damascus. It has to do, I think, something with me feeling at home in New York. Having a band in the city, for me, meant mentally that this is equally home. I split time between composing and playing. So it's not that I'm on tour the whole time. I'm on tour maybe nine months a year or eight months a year. The rest, I'm actually, uh, I get commissions to write music for people. I was uh, named uh, a composer in residence with Classical Movements, which is uh, an organization based in Washington, D.C. I'm writing a piece for the Seattle Symphony. I'm writing a piece for, for a couple of festivals in Europe. Anywhere I am, where my clarinet is, where my computer is, and where I am is where my job. Many years back, my dad heard about Silk Road on, on BBC. And he told me, Kinan, this is, there's a great uh, ensemble that was founded by, by Yoyo Ma. You might want to keep an eye on it. In my work, I never think there's like a, a, there are borders between cultures and everything. And I do that in the music I make. And I met lots of Silk Road members throughout the years from my life in New York, but also from international tours. So when, when I got the, the email, like, would you like to join the ensemble? Would you like to play a couple pieces with us? I was like, yeah, sure. Of course, I was thrilled and honored and everything, but it felt natural as well. I'm a clarinetist of the ensemble, but also I, I compose for the ensemble. When we workshop a piece, for example, all of us have an equal say in, in what's going on. Uh, I compose few pieces for the, for, for the ensemble, but I also uh, I play and I improvise. The most exciting part is when you bring the piece to the ensemble. And that's when, when you get uh, a test drive of the piece, really. What works, what doesn't. And you, you know, you listen to your colleagues because they are, you know, they have their own expertise about things. The way I look at music before 2011, before the Syrian revolution and after, music was maybe, you know, one of my main things. Yes, I like music and I like to play and everything, but now it's urgent. There's the urgency of if you want, wanting to express something that is much larger than who you are. Because we don't have the words to express it, we listen to music. If I'm able to express in words what music does, then there will be no need for the music itself. And when I, when I compose, when I play, I feel that complex of, of emotions going on. 
but I think it's all about the individual. Not only the music maker, but also the music receiver too. So it's, it's an act of freedom by default, enjoying art and making art. So when I, when I write music now, I practice this act of freedom. And for me, it's quite important to do that. Especially when you remember that all what happened in Syria in the last six years, at least the beginning of it, was people wanting to practice that act of freedom and, and, and free expression. So for me, now when I, when I do that, I see myself part of this bigger collective. Up next, CUNY professor Eugene Kudnaski shares his journey from being a persecuted scientist in the Soviet Union to co-chairing a human rights organization that helps his fellow scientists living under hostile governments. Scientists in the Soviet Union, as under any totalitarian regime, were placed under strict ideological scrutiny. Prominent scientists who fell into disgrace with the government were called enemies of the people. As a scientist and university professor in the city of Kharkov, Eugene Chadnovsky recalls one of his meetings with a KGB general. He said, everything that is produced in your head belongs to the Soviet state. <laughs> Pictured here listening to Voice of America with dissident physicist Yakov Alpert, Chadnovsky explains why he felt disgruntled as a scientist in the USSR. I was invited to a number of international conferences, but uh, I was not allowed to go. And the reason for that was that I was involved in some political activities, but also I was of Jewish descent and, you know, KGB particularly, and the government didn't trust Jews. Chadnovsky asked for an exit visa in 1979. He says he was then forced out of his job and became unemployed for the following eight years. I was given three times an official warning from the KGB that if I continue my scientific work, my dissident work, I would be arrested and sentenced to many years in prison. This was a very interesting performance, you know. They invited me to the KGB office, and then they invited people from the street, like witnesses. They opened the book and read to me the official warning of the KGB, that one more time, you know, I do anything like that, they will send me to Siberia, but they never did. And uh, I owe that to uh, the Committee of Concerned Scientists, I think, that uh, made a big noise you know, of all that was happening to me in the Soviet Union. By big noise, Chadnovsky refers to the committee's tactics to raise awareness about a case through the media or through politicians who can lobby for a scientist's circumstance. In this 1986 letter, then Governor of New Hampshire John Sununu brings Chadnovsky's case to the attention of the USSR General Secretary Mikhail Gorbachev, a petition also signed by 80 prominent physicists, including two Nobel laureates. Granted permission to emigrate, this photo shows Chadnovsky later in the U.S. alongside Governor Sununu. Recognized by the United Nations for its human rights work, the Committee of Concerned Scientists formed in the 1970s to initially help persecuted Soviet scientists. It's now expanded to monitoring violations in over 75 countries. Chadnovsky joined the committee soon after he came to New York. He ran the Refugee Scientists Program in the 90s and is now serving as co-chair of the committee for the past 10 years. Nothing brings me more pleasure than learning that the conditions of a scientist imprisoned somewhere have been eased or that scientist was released from prison. A recent release that the committee worked tirelessly for was that of Iranian scientist Omid Kakabi. 
Recognized for his extraordinary intellectual power, Cockabee reportedly denied scientific positions in Iran's military and intelligence organizations. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison, of which he served five before being released in 2016. The case of Amit Kokobi resonated with my own experience in the Soviet Union uh, because uh, I uh, was fortunate not to get in prison, but uh, I was at the same age when this was happening to me. And uh, it's important to say that the best work which is usually done by a physicist is when that physicist is in her or his thirties. If we look through the history of science, this is the most productive age. So for me, not being able to use that productive age most effectively, very similar has occurred to Amit Kokobi. He spent his best years, uh, almost six years, in the Iranian prison. And this was a very talented person, one of the most talented people produced by Iran. Now, hopefully, he will be able to recover and contribute to science and be a happy person. Over many years, we had many cases like that, and someone has to do it, you know. The only thing we always worry about is that the average age of the Committee of Concerned Scientists goes up by one year every year, which means that we don't have many young people joining uh, that work, that effort of the Committee of Concerned Scientists. And, uh, you know, I would like to appeal to younger people who want to join that work if they do. They can contact me and uh, I will make sure that they will be able to make a contribution. For Study with the Best, I'm Viano Ravinka. That's our show for today. For more information on any of our stories, log on to our website at cuny.tv or check out our Study with the Best Facebook page. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time on campus. Bye-bye. <laughs>